we're definitely on on the same wavelength in terms of how we see things so yeah it's been fun to uh, to chat and go down this rabbit hole what the hell is this idea of enlightenment where does deep meditative states take your mind to today on seekers mind talks we are joined by jimmy whiteman aka that meditation guy jimmy has dedicated his life teaching the art of meditation and helping people find inner peace in a world full of chaos but what makes his journey more deep and profound is his connection with meditation master Shinzen Young who is known to bridge the gap between ancient wisdom and modern science being the disciple of Shinzen Jimmy was able to attain profound insights into the practice of meditation and we were able to dive deep into rabbit holes to the idea of enlightenment meditation the nature of our reality and much more don't miss this episode you're watching seekers mind talks the science and spiritual podcast the main thing i would say that comes up a lot on these um type of thing is the person doing the podcast quite often just um talks about meditation as if it's just one thing right as if it's mm-hmm. just focusing on the breath and so quite often i have to somehow get in there and explain to the person and make it clear to everybody listening like oh there's more to it than that um so that's the only thing that i i would say um is kind of important to bring in yeah like what is meditation what is mindfulness that's strangely enough that is overlooked in a lot of these conversations yeah i definitely wanted to dive deep with you because certainly you have been interested in the topic and i picked up wind that uh, you had an insomnia session part in your life that was a dark trench in your life and how many years has it been from there the ride with meditation oh it's a good point so that was probably around 10 years ago mm-hmm. um but it was it was quite a long period where i was playing around with different techniques and things um but it was about 10 years ago i got serious and did my first course and that was a big change oh you already had meditation before that well i'd been experimenting with um um you know how to get to sleep meditation cd's and things like that <laughs> that's but no- nothing really big happened until i actually signed up and went along to uh, a course certainly uh, as you as you pointed out a lot of people have the notion that um, meditation is for uh, looking at your breath and being mindful and uh, and being a stress reliever or i would say those are just the outer layer of what meditation is right yo yeah yeah you that's where most people start so when i started it was all about um just trying to solve the insomnia problem deal with depression feel good and then it escalated from there the more uh benefits i felt the more problems were solved the more my interest grew deeper yeah wow remember reading somewhere that uh, the whole idea of meditation is to be meditating 24/7 is that right um you can do it that way so mm-hmm. essentially if you are cultivating mindfulness and mindful awareness then you absolutely can meditate 24/7 so if if that's the particular system that you sign up for then that's that's fine but there are other systems like transcendental meditation for example where they say you just meditate 20 minutes twice a day and the rest of the time you just get on with your life so it really depends on um the version of meditation that a person is signing up to and of course nowadays because of the internet and because of people like me you end up learning hybrid things so you might learn a kind of version of transcendental meditation from me but you also might learn mindfulness and you might bring the two together so um things are changing nowadays because people don't feel the need to subscribe to one particular system the way they would have years ago but ultimately it's all leading in one direction correct uh i would yes. say that yeah i would say that all techniques will fundamentally if taken to their extreme and if they are um legitimate then there's really only one fundamental breakthrough <laughs> at the end of the tunnel um 
but it can show up in a variety of, di of different ways depending on how you approach it. So um, the person who gets there through intense concentration will have a very different experience to somebody who has a sudden awakening from using a koan or a question, for example, like who mm -hmm. am I or something like that. But fundamentally, um, there is only one breakthrough <laughs> place at the end of uh, at the journey. And this is something that I spoke to my teacher, Shinzen Young, about because that was one of my questions to him after I had had an enlightenment experience. I said, surely there's nowhere to go from here. And he said, well, fundamentally, yeah, you've, you've got to the right place and you're not going to go any further than that, but you can explore within that place now. Wow. What was your moment of flipping the switch? Um, okay. So what happened to me was I was on a retreat called an enlightenment intensive. Now this came after many, many years of meditation and teaching meditation. And I realized at some point I hadn't had, um, the awakening that is spoken about often in Zen, this kind of sudden awakening that you can read about in books like the three pillars of Zen. So I don't know why, but at some point this idea just got to me. Like, I just felt like, I have to get this thing. It was almost an obsession. And I found out about this retreat called an enlightenment intensive and I signed up to it and I went along and it's very, very intense. You're working with a question. Um, everybody starts with the question, who am I? And you use that question to turn your attention back away from what's going on in the senses towards what seems to be you right now. What is this mysterious, alive presence that seems to be here right now? And if you turn your attention to that, you just can't quite seem to get hold of it. You know, something is here because something is awake and alive and doing the practice. But you can't seem to locate what seems to be you exactly. And anything that your mind does throw up clearly isn't you because you're not your name. You're not your body. You're not other things like that. You know, you're... Um, past history, things like that. So you just keep looking from six in the morning till 11 o'clock at night, um, working on this question, really intense practice. Even in the breaks, you um, keep working on it. Even at lunchtime, you keep working on it. Uh, when you wake up in the morning, you're on the question. When you fall asleep at night, you're on the question. Anyway, in my case, I got to the end of the retreat and it had been a very powerful experience. I'd had all kinds of um, quite out there, mystical experiences and visions and energy, but I, I had not got the answer to the question. You know if you've got the answer because you can go and speak to one of the people running the retreat and say, this is who I am. You know, you present your answer to the question or you tell them what's happened and they will tell you whether you're just in your head and you're thinking about stuff or whether you've actually had a direct experience um, of the nature of consciousness. And so I knew I hadn't, I knew it hadn't happened for me. And the retreat pretty much ended. I was about to go to bed and one of the people running it, who is somebody very experienced in Zen, called me over and said, oh, Jimmy, can I speak to you for a sec? I said, yeah, sure. I sat opposite him. He looked me in the eyes and he said, tell me who you are. And then suddenly everything just flipped over my normal sense of self completely just dissolved. And what was left was indescribable, but I will attempt to describe it just by saying that it was open, vast, and an infinite sense of self that was nothing like my normal sense of self and clearly not belonging to this particular mind and body. And there was a lot of laughing, a lot of tears, a lot of just thinking, wow. And there was a general sense that everything in the universe was just completely in harmony and perfect. That's the only way I can describe it. And that lasted full on for about three days. And then the after effects, the kind of afterglow of that lasted for a few months. And I spoke to my teacher, Shinzen Young, who wasn't on that retreat. He's um, 
a well-known meditation teacher who wrote a book called The Science of Enlightenment. In fact, it was him who got me interested in the topic of enlightenment in the first place. I spoke to him about it. And when I described it to him, he said, ah, yeah, this is what's known in Zen as Satori. Because in Zen, you can have Kensho, which is a taste of enlightenment, or you can have Satori, which is a much deeper immersion into that experience, which really goes right down to the level of identity and a, a shift out of your normal sense of being who you are and awakening into a, a much bigger sense of self, so to speak. And yeah, he, he confirmed this to be Satori because of the way I was talking about um, a shift at the level of identity. Um, and so, yeah, that was the first enlightenment experience that I've had. But I've had more since because I've done a lot more of those retreats. But the first one is always the biggest one because you could never expect that. You could never see that coming. <laughs> and so... I don't think after that one, um, I could ever be that surprised again. You know what I mean? Um, because now there's something known here, which can't be rediscovered in the same way. Um, but I've still had direct experiences, awakenings, enlightenment experiences, whatever you want to call them. I've had them since, but they've been very, very different. That first one was like the big bang and there's really no going back from that. How, how did your actions change before? Like, how was Jimmy before that experience? And how did Jimmy start acting differently out to the world and being good for yourself? Because uh, that's what, what other people experience, right? Mm, oh, yeah, there's a big shift in, in the way you act, or in, in the, my case, in the way I acted after that experience. Um, because the way I'm interacting with other people was completely different. If a person was opposite me and they insulted me, let's say, after that experience, well, there was nowhere for that insult to land because the normal sense of being Jimmy wasn't there. It felt like they were just throwing that insult into the void. <laughs> so you couldn't really take anything personally. Uh, because there was no personal self there. There's a, like a general sense of just a warm, loving, open presence that's much bigger than this mind-body system that's here normally. Um, so that massively, massively changes things because you will never be caught up in your storyline of being you in quite the same way after an experience like that. But having said that, after a certain amount of time, the ego does come back online, self-referential thinking comes back online, your normal um, old conditioning and past traumas and stuff come back online. So in the early days after that, it's after that experience, it's all bliss, it's all happiness, it's all wow. Uh, but like I say, the glow of that fades, most of your normal sense of self comes back. And then what happens is, you will find yourself reacting, or at least I did, you will find yourself reacting in old ways, going back to your old um, way of operating. But the difference now is that <laughs> I know what actions are in line with who I really am, what was discovered in that experience, and what actions and reactions are really just belonging to this character, Jimmy, This is um, that's been formed over time by all the things that I've been through in my life. Because a lot of the way Jimmy acts really is a um, is a personality that's been collated over time to basically keep a wall of protection up. Um, you know, when we're young, we find ways of coping, and those coping mechanisms become our personality in in many cases, um, and our way of operating and our way of being in the world. Not all of it, but a, a good degree of it. So, yeah, you can see much more clearly when you're being incongruent with your true self after you've had uh, an enlightenment experience. So, do you believe, uh, so is it the consciousness of other people that sort of gets us back into our ego because to exist into the world we sort of have have to average out to the consciousness of everybody is is it is is it that what drags us back 
That's a good question. So, yeah, interacting with other people will likely um, trigger that old sense of self to come back online. Especially because other people reflect to you who they think you are, and that's going to trigger you to um, go back into playing that character. So I imagine it would be a lot easier to um, stay in the enlightened consciousness if you are off living on your own in some mountain retreat somewhere really beautiful with nobody around, then yeah, you I'm sure you would just relax out of that ego sense. But when you're back in your life and there's bills to be paid and there's problems to be solved and there's people to interact with, yeah, that's definitely going to bring you back into your normal sense of self. And that's fine, actually. It's not a problem to be solved. The way I see the ego now, and when I say the ego, I mean just who you think you are, really. When What I see that now is it is a, a unique expression of this other thing that was discovered in the Enlightenment experience. Um, so I don't see Jimmy's ego as something to be killed or destroyed or anything like that. I just see that having a personality and having a sense of self is actually quite useful for going around in the world and being who you are. Um, it would be quite difficult to go around all the time in fully enlightened consciousness that like you probably just wouldn't care enough about small things. Um, so yeah, enlightenment experiences, they come and go, but you allow them to inform the normal sense of self. And so you can sort of fuse the two things together. Um, and that would be a balanced enlightenment. Some people will become far too attached to the no self, to enlightened consciousness, and some people are far too attached in the ego. So ideally, you want to bring the two things together, and then you can have the best of both worlds. What is the deepest reality that meditation showed you? Because the reason I ask you this is, we both know what vipassana is. And, and, and let me just explain to whoever is listening that vipassana is a 10-day meditation session where you don't talk to anybody, you don't look anybody in the eye. You, so you're constantly looking at yourself, what's left there, what's after, without any distraction. You're not talking. You can talk to your teacher if you have any doubts on how the practice is to be conducted. But other than that, 10 days, you are constantly meditating 12 to 14 hours or even 24 hours, I should go go and say, because that was my experience. And uh, it showed me ve a very different form of reality. And that's very hard to describe as what you explained at first, the moment of your enlighten enlightenment. And it showed me deep realities. What is the deepest reality that meditation showed you? Um, okay, so just quickly, the, the slight difference between what we're talking about here is that Vipassana is a gradual approach to mm -hmm. enlightenment. And even on the course, you'll probably remember that the teacher, SN Goenka, says it may take many, many lifetimes <laughs> to get to the end goal with uh, Vipassana. Uh, the retreat I was talking about tries to put you in a situation which will give you a sudden awakening. So essentially it kind of catapults you to the, uh, to the end goal, but that's why it doesn't last. It tends to wear off um, after a period of time. And that's why I prefer to get people to do an approach that mixes both. So you can do the gradual approach, but do the sudden approach at the same time. So I teach people how to meditate, but then I also say, hey, if you want to put things on steroids, you want to go on these kind of retreats. And I give them some advice about that. So anyway, to answer your question, the reality that is experienced in a moment of sudden awakening, like a Satori, is beyond words, beyond concepts. But you could say that it was a recognition that um, my whole life had been a case of mistaken identity because 
from my point of view, I am this Jimmy character who's going around doing things, solving problems. And sure, I subscribed to a philosophy of being something, you know, some consciousness being bigger than that. And I was already interested in spiritual ideas and things like that. But in the moment of awakening, um, that is experienced so directly that it's not a philosophy. It's not an idea. It is literally like everything falls away and you are just shown directly that this is the nature of consciousness. But your intellectual mind can't understand what's really happening. So it's really strange because it's it's an experience that's different to any other kind of experience and it leads to a knowing that's different from every other kind of knowing. <laughs> so it's almost just something that I can't really talk about. But it certainly did feel like in that moment that I was knowing myself on a level that was beyond birth and death. And that was known in a way that felt completely beyond all doubt. Uh, it wasn't vague in any way. It was absolutely beyond all doubt. Yeah. That's what makes it special, right? Because even when I went to Vipassana, what Goinka was telling was that you don't have to listen to anybody. What you experience is as, as the truth, is the truth, because it's your experience and nobody is coming there, right? Nobody is trying to manipulate you or direct you. It's not a philosophy. It's not an idea. The whole idea, I'll just explain Vipassana for those who don't know. It's just looking at your body sensations and you look at it in a very deep level. Yeah, your experience sounds to me what would be called in Buddhism, Banga, dissolution. So, loss, loss of your sense of self. Dissolution of the sense of self. Yeah, yeah, so actually, yeah, so this is interesting because I've never heard anybody uh, talk about this, having this on a Vipassana retreat. So this is very interesting to me because um, it is the sense of I that shifts <laughs> in an enlightenment experience. So, yeah, it's quite possible that you had your own uh, enlightenment experience, which is more along the lines of a sudden awakening, which is really, really cool because Vipassana is not known for that. But essentially what you wake up to is what you um, are at the deepest level anyway. So there's no reason why you wouldn't. I mean, everybody already is their true self. It's just that most people uh, don't know it. <laughs> so there's no reason why a person couldn't wake up um, to their true self at any moment, really. It doesn't have to be through a retreat. It doesn't have to be through um, doing meditation. You know, there are stories of people who had spontaneous awakenings. So, yeah, these, these things are open to anyone. They're not reserved for special people, certainly not for meditation teachers and yogis and things like that. Um, plenty of people do have these experiences and how they relate to them usually... Um, is to do with their beliefs beforehand. So if I'm a Buddhist and I have an experience of this, um, the, like the one we've described, then I'll say, ah, okay, I became the no self because I might recognize that there was a lack of personal self in it. And I already have the context of no self or void. But if I'm a Hindu, I might have an experience like this and say, ah, that's the true self because that was the idea that was implanted before. And if I was a Christian, uh, you know, and I was into these deep practices. Well, of course, then I might say, ah, I, I experienced God or I became God um, and so on and so forth. So it's really interesting to me that after an event like this, which is non-conceptual, cannot be understood in any way uh, or described in any way. So we tend to look at what we already knew um, before this happened and then try and fit the experience into uh, the framework that we already were given either at school or by a, a particular group or a book or a teacher at some point along the line. Yeah, uh, I, I, I don't want to totally attribute my experience to Vipassana, but as you explained, I think we are on the same path because I used to do Silva meditation even before uh, Vipassana. And um, so... Silva meditation is more like lying down and Vipassana is what as of my teacher told me was to sit and 
what the experience i got was i was lying down after the regular day after a regular day of vipassana and since i'm so accustomed to silva uh, it sort of both happened to me simultaneously so i was doing silva and vipassana at the same time because i couldn't stop at that point because my you know you know the experience of meditation after a point it just happens and both of these things were sort of congruent and happening simultaneously and i got burst out of myself that's the best thing i can say because as you were explaining different the ideologies that you had within you before is how you relate to it yeah yeah and you you picked up on something interesting here because one of the interesting facts i've learned about doing these kind of retreats that are geared up to try and give people the sudden awakening the kensho or the satori is that a lot of the awakenings that are triggered don't actually happen in the meditation room all the practice happens there or oh, well the intense practice um but quite often people have the awakenings while they're walking around in the grounds in nature or sometimes while they're eating or sometimes they'll have it while they're just going to bed or sometimes even in a dream sometimes you can have a dream i mean this hasn't happened to me but i've heard about it happening to other people you can have a dream where you awaken to your true nature and then you wake up and then boom there it is enlightened consciousness so it sounds like you had something along those lines where essentially you were just ripe for this kind of thing to happen and you took yourself on that retreat you did some work and then the stars aligned and you got what you were looking for and am i right in thinking that in a sense it didn't really feel like it was you that did it but it's more like something that just happened spontaneously 100% like even <laughs> if you even if you sit for an hour of meditation uh, you you'll see that things start to happen by itself and i somewhere had the notion that if it's if if there's this thing called enlightenment which so many people from our history is talking about it should be effortless and and i remember reading from your side that uh, what you're looking for has already been there it's just that when you see it you say like ah that's it it was exactly like that yeah it's the old um analogy of the fish searching for water you know <laughs> <laughs> but until you see it you you won't understand and then suddenly it's so obvious so clear it was always right here but um it's yeah it it's the the discovery is um always going to be so surprising because you you just couldn't see that coming um and we should also just clarify quickly that although we're talking about enlightenment which is a big thing um the way i see it is when i talk about enlightenment i usually use that word to mean the whole process so that's from you know the first time you ever meditated right to the very last time uh, and that includes everything that happens on the journey so all the awakenings all the mystical experiences um so when i say oh i had an experience of enlightenment that's not to say like oh i'm enlightened now and that's done <laughs> it's just one of the things that happened on the path that just happens to be an experience of enlightenment and it sort of moves things forward but um it doesn't suggest that there's any sort of end point been reached you know <laughs> is everything one consciousness the idea is that consciousness is a field and it's not specific to this particular mind and body so we all share one consciousness consciousness is a field and within the field there is a kind of distortion which makes it seem like it's my consciousness that belongs to jimmy So the technique itself using this mantra in an effortless way allows my awareness to drop from the surface level of mind where my thoughts are fully formed and fully verbalized and there's a kind of a narrative self happening at all times my my awareness can drop away from that level of mind down into deeper levels of mind where i'll start to experience the subconscious that will be old memories from childhood old emotions that are stored in the system and if i can stay with that and keep using the mantra to take me deeper and deeper into the mind past the subconscious i can even have a moment of transcendence where i drop out of the mind altogether and in theory according to 
the doctrine of transcendental meditation, um, when I have that moment of cessation, that moment of transcendence, that's dropping back into the unified field of consciousness that we all share. Now, whether a person believes that or not <laughs> is, a, is a different thing. But what I can say is that the practice itself does feel like that. It does feel like you go deep into your mind, deep into yourself. You can experience this inner stillness, inner silence. And these moments of transcendence do come. And when they do, although you don't really experience anything when it's happening, when you come out the other side, you can feel very refreshed, very relaxed. And you tend to get some great side effects from that. It's a little bit like getting a laptop and closing all the windows and doing a restart. When you come back on, you feel much brighter, more alert, more focused, more creative. And these are all said to be benefits of dropping down um, into the deepest levels of mind, into the unified field, and then coming back out um, and then operating from that place. So getting out of doing mode, getting into the being mode, coming back out of that and then operating from that place of being. Yeah, so you were talking about that transcendental meditation and you were talking as though the ego is a distortion to the field. But the if everything is really one consciousness, then that distortion is meant to be there, right? Um, yeah, exactly. So one way that you could look at it is it's not that the non-dual consciousness is the correct one and dualistic um, consciousness and dualistic experience is wrong. It's just that they, they both... Um, but having both in your experience allows you to to see two different sides of how things are. Most people exist purely in dual, dualism, have no idea that non-dual experience is even a possibility, and don't even really know that it's a philosophy that you can even subscribe to. Um, so it's when you get into meditation and you might have these experiences of oneness where you might then start to recognize, ah, okay, there's more to the nature of who and what I am than I realized before. But just like you said, it's not that um, dualistic life or the sense of being yourself is somehow wrong. Um, when I use that word distortion, I don't really mean it in a negative way at all. A better way to say it would be that that distortion is a unique expression of something else. So, you know... Um, <laughs> it's not like I want to just get rid of my normal sense of self and melt back into the oneness and just kind of float around being nothing. No, I want to be able to dip into that other side of life and then also live a perfectly normal life of being a husband and having a dog and eating nice food and doing all the things that people do. Um, it's just that I also have this other side of my life where I explore an aspect of consciousness which is not available to the average person who isn't into this kind of thing. Yeah, then I think what is safe to say is that it's better to just touch the other side of this non-dual perspective and to see that that's there and see how that how you change your decisions in your life after that. Yeah, that is a good way to look at it. So yeah, how, how is your life outside of meditation and outside of the retreat getting better? And how is your behavior becoming better? Um, and how are you being more positive to yourself and to other people? These are all good ways of recognizing whether or not your practice is actually working on a practical level. And um, if your behavior is not looking better then there's something wrong in the practice yeah mm, correct uh since we're talking about non-duality i had a, a a neuroanatomist from harvard jill bolte taylor you might have heard about her yeah i had her on my show it's not out yet and she talks about this she had a stroke on her uh, left brain apparently and the boundaries of her body broke she could see herself as one thing, like me and the laptop are not different. It's just one and of the same thing. It's just that when your brain gets in the way, it sort of causes a barrier to see that there's a separate you. But that's 
that's a different game altogether right and and um, and there is new research coming in to science as well right there is that consciousness is primary and everything is one and you might have uh, read about anil seth and it yeah he tells about that your brain is actively generating reality and i also had another brain scientist on my show and he was telling that the brain is acting as a filter of reality instead of showing what's really out there it is just trying to filter out and stop you and giving you this sort of a two-eyed experience yeah that's how i would see it so a moment of enlightenment or a moment of awakening whatever you want to call it is a moment when the filter switches off <laughs> and then you get unfiltered reality and my sense of it is that my experience is a bit like Jill's in that my first experience anyway in that I recognize like ah okay what's here what seems to be me is also out there and there's no boundary between in and out um but at the same time I was fully aware that I had a body and I didn't want to get hit by a bus or anything um it was just more of a felt sense of like ah the essence of me in here is also essentially out there it was more like that that's the only way I could begin to describe it yeah so do you somewhere inside of Jimmy believe that uh we both are talking to the same person right <laughs> well there's two different personalities but there's only one um true nature. I haven't got anything really groundbreaking to say about it apart from the fact that I've noticed distortions in time from when I'm meditating and when I'm doing retreats and things. So it's quite clear that the way consciousness interprets time um is tied to what's happening experientially. But I have absolutely no idea um scientifically speaking or in reality what's happening with time um i just know from my own personal experience that it can become seriously distorted um in certain circumstances funnily enough one of the retreats that i like to go on is at a place called spirit horse in wales and one of the things that they do there on this retreat is they cover up all mirrors and they make everyone um take their watches off and of course you're not allowed your phone because it's a retreat and they also cover up all clocks so they want you to on this retreat lose your sense of identity by not seeing any reflection of yourself and also lose your sense of time by not having access to a um a watch or a clock and things like that and those things do seem to help in terms of letting getting people to a place where they can let go and surrender and maybe uh, an awakening can happen so yeah losing your sense of time may possibly be a factor in awakening as well but it's purely conjecture you know <laughs> how can a person start his meditation journey so somebody who wants to try meditation but has never done it before um well the most simple thing is simply just to sit somewhere quietly and follow your breath and for most people what they will realize is that it's really difficult because you have the intention to breathe and know that you are breathing and not be doing something else but quite quickly they will realize that they don't have the choice to pay attention to what they want to pay attention to in the way that they thought they did we all feel like we're going around and we're in control of everything we don't realize actually um that that's not quite how it is and um that sense of me being the one who's making decisions and being in control um can be looked at from different angles and can be deconstructed and it's very interesting when you start to do that so yeah anyone who wants to try meditation just see how long you can follow the breath for see how difficult it is and once you see that then there are plenty of directions that you can go in with teachers and guided meditations and books you can read um but it's very very simple to start out for anybody who wants to try it just yeah breathe relax pay attention to the breath and then see what happens see how easy or how difficult it is to do that so how how do you tackle thoughts at that point because when you sit what you observe is you see that millions of thoughts just pop out and it might be your trauma might be just random thoughts uh i don't want to use the word tackle how do you surf through it 
Right, well, this will depend on the particular technique that you happen to be using. So if you're using um, effortless mantra meditation, then, for example, then you would just allow the thoughts to be there. You wouldn't fight with them. You wouldn't suppress them. You wouldn't see them as a problem to be solved. You would just allow them to be there, but you would gently favor the mantra above everything else. Mm -hmm. And there are different thought patterns that are going to come up and there are different ways to handle them. But generally speaking, as a rule, that's how you do it. Um, there are other techniques where you can actually turn towards thoughts and deconstruct them in real time. For example, I teach a style of meditation called see, hear, feel. That is a particular technique. Now, thoughts can appear as either an image projected on, it feels like it's projected on a kind of mental screen, or thoughts might be um, an auditory experience. It might feel like there's a voice in your head or a song playing in your mind, something like that. So you can be mindful of how thoughts are actually arising, recognize that there is no thinker of the thought, and that the thought is just appearing in a particular space in a particular way. And that'll give you clarity on that. So there are different ways to approach thoughts, but the most important thing is that you're not fighting with them, you're not suppressing them, and you're not seeing them as a problem to be solved. You can either just ignore them and focus on something else, or you can turn towards them and deconstruct them, depending on the technique you're using, depending on um, the system that you're using to explore consciousness. Mm -hmm. At this point, do you believe that uh, any of the thoughts that come up in your head are your own? Well, it depends. What do you mean by you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, that's a different question altogether. You can, I think it was Ramana Maharishi who went searching for that who am I question and he never found it. And maybe we can never find it. But we... I am comparing this to a normal everyday person uh, who can think that I make my thoughts. I is that a reality? Do we make our thoughts? Do you think your thoughts are yours or is it just popping out of your head as you just said? Um, the thoughts don't really belong to anyone, but they arise due to the pattern which seems to be me. So the way that Jimmy is, isn't random. Like I'm going to look the same tomorrow ish <laughs> as similar to what I look like today. And that's similar to what I look like yesterday. Similarly in the way my mind works. Um, I don't know what my next thought will be, but it will probably be the kind of thing that Jimmy thinks. It will likely be in English if it's a verbalized thought and it will if I have to solve a problem, I will probably solve it in a way that I've solved problems in the past. Uh, it's unlikely that I'll come up with something completely novel, just out of the blue. Um, so what we all are is a kind of pattern in this sense, you know, just in the way that an oak tree tends to be an oak tree or a rose tends to be a rose. I tend to be a human being and I just happen to be this particular expression of human being. Um, so any thoughts that are arising are arising out of this particular pattern and as a, a side effect of the conditioning that just happens to be here, but nobody really owns it. Is that what they call karma? Uh, well, karma in Sanskrit means action. So yeah, I think you could use it in that sense in, in the way that um, actions have consequences and so we're all experiencing karma. But then there's another way that you can appreciate it as well in that um, this particular pattern, <laughs> which is coming out of nature that we're calling Jimmy, um, there is a side of that, which is I am a conscious being and I, I do seem to be able to make choices. And so um, so I, I seem to be able to direct my life in certain ways and some ways will create more karma, which is a bit like drama, you know what I mean? Um, attachments and clinging and basically problems for the future and for other people or there are ways of acting which um, will create less karma as in drama and problems for the future um, and we've stumbled into an area now which I don't have an answer for which is basically um, 
are there it is our are our actions predetermined and do we have any free will <laughs> and the answer is i don't know about uh free will it's something i've thought a huge amount about and i can't really find any evidence of it in mm. if i think about it in a phil- philosophical sense and yet in my everyday life it very much feels like i have free will so <laughs> um and i pay attention to what I'm doing in order to uh, not cause problems, like I say. But at the same time, if I zoom out and I look at the big picture, I um, you can't really find any evidence for it. So it's one of those strange paradoxes which you just have to embrace when you're talking about enlightenment. Life is 100%, 99% paradoxes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Correct. Correct. Uh, well, what are some places people get stuck on their meditation journey normally? Oh, this is a good question. So you can definitely get stuck in a number of places. And I would say the most common place is the tranquility trap, so to speak. Mm-hmm. So you might actually get into meditation, become pretty good at it, and then think, ah, okay, this is all about becoming calm and peaceful, and then spend the next 20 years just becoming calm and peaceful every day for a short period and that has its benefits physically and mentally and if that's what a person wants that's fine i'm not going to put that down but at the same time you might be missing out on some stuff because you're not going to get any insights you're unlikely to get what we've been talking about the awakenings and the enlightenment experiences and you might even um avoid the more practical low level insights into just the nature of how your mind works and your conditioning and your traumas and things like that because you're just spending all of your time working in a way that will make you tranquil for example a person who lies on their bed and listens to relaxing music is probably not going to get the same benefit as somebody who learns how to do um mahasi noting a type of vipassana which gives you a deep insight into the nature of um how your mind moves and how your mind body system interacts for example um so yeah that's one of the major stumbling blocks for a lot of people is um getting stuck in the tranquility not going deeper into the insight um but there are lots of other um places people can get stuck as well one of the bits of advice that my teacher gave me is to not get stuck in the what he called the enlightenment trap <laughs> which is because i'd had one experience of enlightenment um some people will have that and then just go off and think they're done and teach as if there's some enlightened yogi sage or something and he said whatever you do don't do that you need to keep exploring keep deepening and broadening your realization and uh, don't think that you've got it because a year from now you'll look back on this and you'll think oh i didn't know anything back then um so don't fall into that trap and um there are some other things as well but these are the kinds of things that come up yeah how do you move forward from that uh, tranquility trap so a good way to go beyond that is to start using techniques which are to do with breaking down um the nature of self so deconstructing the nature of self or um working with what you've used on your retreat the pasanas that kind of thing will take you out of the tranquility and more into the self understanding so any techniques which are to do with self understanding are um going to be useful for taking you out of the tranquility mhm mhm uh i'm giving you a what if scenario uh what if everybody in the world was sort of into meditation will that make the whole world into a monk like culture or would we be way way more advanced spiritually technologically culturally and in all other aspects i don't think we would all turn into monks no no i think everybody would still feel the need to express themselves in the way that um feels good to them and we all seem to have within us certain ways of expressing that we want to do so for example my wife she wants to paint 
that's you know her thing she wants to be an artist and so there's just something in her driving that and I couldn't say what that is or how that's come around it's certainly not motivated by money or anything but she just wants to paint and she wants to show other people how to paint and we all have this you know you you're interested in consciousness and everybody wants to express themselves in a certain way and I think if people were meditating more they would be less caught up in consumer culture and maybe more uh, in tune with that sense of what's inside them that wants to be expressed and which wants to be um, kind of given to the world, so to speak. So I think we'd probably have uh, more fun. <laughs> we'd be less tangled up in um, the voyeurism of social media and things like that. And um, we'd probably be more healthy and more free in our mind. But you'd, you'd still have loads of... Um, negative stuff you know you'd still have people's shadows would rear their ugly heads you'd still have people who would um have enlightenment experiences and then the ego would come in and sort of claim the enlightenment and put them on a pedestal i'm sure you'd still have loads and loads of the problems that you get now um but i would imagine that it would be a much um more free and fair and uh, generally peaceful, calm society. But I, I don't think it would solve all the problems, no. <laughs> hmm. mm -hmm. But we still will need... What's your take on science and spirituality? Uh, two different ways of exploring the same thing. Um, so you've probably heard of things like the double slit experiment and um, there are of course, lots of scientists who, when they look very deeply into the nature of reality, have almost turned into yogis. If you look at some of the famous quotes from uh, people like Schrodinger and uh, Max Planck, um, people like that, they start talking about consciousness uh, almost as if they are a yogi or a Buddhist or something like that. I mean, apparently Schrodinger used to write on his blackboard to all of his students at Harvard or I think he was somewhere like Harvard or somewhere like that. He used to write Atman is Brahman on his <laughs> blackboard. <laughs> and um, Max Planck said, I mean, he, he won a Nobel Prize for his work in um, quantum physics. I mean, he's the, gra the, the daddy of quantum physics. And he said, I think consciousness is fundamental. He might as well have been quoting from the Vedas, you know. And so it does seem to me that when you get these guys, uh, these men and women who look very deeply into the nature of reality, they start becoming all spiritualized. And I don't think that's a coincidence. So, yeah, two different ways of exploring the same thing. Yeah. That's partly the reason why I started this podcast because science is also inquiry. Spirituality is also inquiry. It's just that science needs a bit more physicality to it. And just as you explained, when you go deep into that physicality, you can see that it's self-dissolving. Oh, it is. A hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, emptiness and em empty space and energy vibrating. Yeah, I mean, I mean that simple fact that like if you look at my hand right now, it's made of atoms and each atom is 99.99% emptiness. And it's all this emptiness that's showing up as something that's physical, that's tangible. And um, it's definitely useful. Science is definitely 100% useful. Like we can make laptops. I can, I can have a podcast session with you. So we don't want to take out science. It's just that we, we want that inquirer perspective to shine more on the world. Am I right to talk in that sense? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, the woman that you talked about earlier, Jill Balty taylor there are people like her who've managed to get both sides of it. In her case, it was because of um, a bit of a twist of fate that she had this uh, brain aneurysm or something. But she suddenly had a spiritual experience and a scientific background. And there are other people like that, too. There's a brilliant book um, by somebody called Candice Pert. She's not around anymore, but she was a scientist in the 70s. And her book is called The Molecules of Emotion. And she looked very deeply into the nature of how our bodies store and release emotions and that 
completely spiritualized her. You know, she had something like 200 peer reviewed papers up. She was a very serious scientist. And then she ended up becoming an outcast in the science community because she became too spiritual. <laughs> and they started looking down on her. So she was adopted by the spiritual community in the end. And she ended up going around their conferences and giving her talks, talking about what she discovered in her um, time in the scientific world, right on the cutting edge of science as well. This is not just some kooky person who, you know, um, did a few experiments. This is somebody who had a, a huge influence in her day. And there's probably loads of people out there um, who are like this, but most of the money is being funneled into things that are more tangible. So their voice isn't going to be as heard as loudly as um, mm -hmm. some of the other voices that are a bit more mainstream. Yeah. There, there, there is this uh, book from, I think it's called Thomas, it's from Thomas Kuhn, The Structure of Scientific Revolution. And it broadly speaks where like science, it goes into a, in one direction and it kind of reaches a barrier. And to break that barrier, you have to have a, start having a different perspective. And somehow all these sort of experiences from scientists makes me feel that that's the next step humans will be taking. Because we, we've, re, we've been at quantum mechanics for, I don't know, four decades now, and there has not been a breakthrough after that. I mean, I think there's string theory after that, but, but uh, maybe we are going in the direction of consciousness as, if, you, if we start looking consciousness as primary and see how we can make a theory with, you know, quantum mechanics, sing, string theory, the phys I mean, the physicality and the metaphysical. Somehow, if, if we try to string that up together, we might get a new string theory. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I like the sound of that. Yeah, although I'm way out of my league at the moment with this conversation. So um, I couldn't say whether that's on the cards or not, but I, I at, certainly at this like point, that we're idea. Just exploring. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, my teacher, Shinzen Young, wrote a book called The Science of Enlightenment, actually. Uh -huh. And he tried to bring the rigor of science and the measurement of science to spiritual practice mm -hmm. um, to try and merge the two in that sense. And the final chapter of his book is looking at whether or not um, scientists and scientific inquiry might be able to bring enlightenment to more people um, through devices and through technology in order to sort of give people a helping hand so that you don't have to go on retreat for 50 years um, like someone like him, um, we might be able to sort of get people there so that they can have an experience of their true nature um, with a lot less of the legwork involved. Mm -hmm. um, so that's an idea of science and spirituality merging, which is very interesting to me. Whether that will happen in my lifetime, I'm not quite sure, but it's um, something that people are working on. And in fact, Shinzen and his team are working on that in their lab called the Sema Lab out in California. Um, so yeah, there's definitely good things coming along there. Shinzen is about 80, though, um, at the moment. He's a former monk. Um, so <laughs> I... I uh... Yeah, he, he's somebody who has a lifetime of practice, so a very different understanding of the mind and consciousness to the average person. And he certainly believes that it's possible. So, um, so yeah, looks it like there's interesting um, avenues to be explored there. Oh, hopefully that happens. What, what was the finding of Candice regarding uh, the spinal cord that you just mentioned earlier? Okay, so Candice per Pert's research said that um, that we all have peptides in the body and we have peptide receptors everywhere in the body, not just in uh, the brain. There can be in the skin, in the muscles, I think. So, so in the whole body. So essentially, we can experience um, emotions via peptides at any place in the body. So this is why a person might go to a yoga class and be put into a certain pose and then because of that pose re-experience some trauma and have a big release because the uh, trauma that they experienced is being stored in that particular place in the body. Whereas before she came along and started talking about this, it was just assumed that um, traumatic traumatic experiences were just memories 
uh, in the mind or in the brain, something like that. But no, it turns out that um, these peptide and peptide receptors are all over the body. So when I teach somebody to meditate, they can get into a place which is very, very deeply relaxed. And because the body gets into a place where it's deeply calm and deeply relaxed, it sort of sends a message to the nervous system to say, hey, um, we're in a safe spot. Why don't we process some old emotions which are trapped in the system? And that's why uh, when people go into that kind of deep meditation, they will likely start to re-experience some old stress, some old trauma, some old memories from childhood or some old emotions, something like that. It's The system is clearing out some of that old stuff. It can happen in other styles of meditation, but um, I mention it happening with transcendental meditation right now because that's the style of meditation that Candice Pert was actually practicing herself. So not only was she seeing this happening in the lab and she was discovering it, she was also discovering it in her own practice while she was doing TM meditation because that was the big thing at the time in the 1970s. Um, <laughs> because the Beatles discovered it and they kind of popularized it. That, that's that's amazing. Is it is it in some way related to all these uh, seven chakras and all these ideologies that people talk about? It, it's related, but it's not the same thing. But there's a really interesting part in her book where a yogi just turns up at her doorstep one day and asks whether or not her maps of the nervous system will map onto his uh, ancient map of the chakras. And mm -hmm. so together they have a look um, at whether the chakras maps onto what she's look what she's talking about. And she was amazed to discover that the science and the spirituality matched up pretty much perfectly. So, uh, yeah, definitely along the right lines there. Wow. 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 I, I was researching on meditation and I, I kind of stumbled onto this idea of rainbow body ascension. What is that? It, it poked my interest. Um, as far as I'm aware, that is to do with Tibetan Buddhism and the practices mm -hmm. there, but I've never personally practiced it, so I couldn't mm -hmm. um, give you a first-hand account. Um, Have you read about it? It's, it's something to do with esoteric uh, Tibetan Buddhism, I believe, but even that I'm not 100% sure about. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I, I was looking at your uh, your Instagram page and I found something called the Jhana State, and I think that's something that relates to this. Is it? The jhanas are um, deep states of absorption that you can get to through practicing concentration. So mm -hmm. it's not necessarily my sort of number one area of expertise, but I do have um, some experience there. So what you would need to do if you wanted to get into the jhanas is start with access concentration. So get really, really good at, let's say, following the breath. And at a certain point, when you've got this unbroken stream of concentration resting on an object, you will at some point have something appear in the mind. So let's say you're meditating with your eyes closed, you might see a light um, in your mind, a very subtle object in the mind. And if you put your attention on that subtle object in the mind, which isn't necessarily uh, it, it's not to do with your outside senses it's a, something that's occurring in the mind and give your attention to that that can take you into the jhanas um, that's a very very basic explanation of how you might begin to get close to that level of absorption one of the problems with it is it takes quite a long time to get there so for me personally to try and get that that inner light known as Namitas takes me about 45 minutes just to get to the point where I might get into the first jhana. So <laughs> a lot of people don't have the time uh, to get there. But for those who do, and if they do this usually on a retreat, then you can move up the jhanas through stages. Um, there are four material jhanas, and then there are another um, four or five jhanas that go on after that which seem to be out of body but like i say it's not necessarily my area of expertise so um i can't tell you much more than that have have you read about uh, how how dmt is being naturally secreted in our heads because it's a psychoactive compound and it seems to be there in our heads and nobody knows the reason why uh, have you read about it um i've heard 
that what you've just said i i've heard that to be true and it kind of makes sense um because why not i mean we are a part of nature so anything that is growing in the ground could easily be found within us because we are essentially made of the same elements as the things outside of us so i don't i don't see it as being that strange or that weird um but i do think it's interesting what it could mean like what what can we do with that and what are we going to discover about that going forward um is fascinating but i don't know enough about it really to speculate more on that mm-hmm. what what about the intuitional wisdom that we get how do we get those intuitions like sometimes i feel my brain is just stuck it doesn't give me any intuitions and when i sit and meditate and and even when i if i do this podcast sessions 5 minutes before i do the seven chakra asanas and that seems to be having an effect on my body because i can feel that flow happening inside me so there's this as i as we just spoke about before there there are seven chakras in the body right this is for all those who are listening and then if i do that seven chakra activation poses just 5 minutes before my session it my my, my brain seems to be just flowing and it seems to be popping out with intuitions how does the intuition wisdom work well that's a good question um well the mind and the body are intrinsically linked so it doesn't surprise me that by um doing certain actions with your body you're getting certain results in your mind so that makes sense you know that's like classic yoga really now if you want to trigger wisdom from beyond the mind you know how we talked about the mind is kind of like a pattern and the thoughts i'll have in a minute are going to be along the same lines as the thoughts i'm having right now um if you want to tr- sort of get out of that and start to tap into intuitive wisdom then there are certain ways you can do that one of the ways is what we already talked about in using a mantra for example to take yourself take awareness away from the surface level of the mind where thoughts are fully formed and fully verbalized down into deeper levels of mind and even have moments of transcendence where you go beyond the beyond the mind um as you come out of that state it wouldn't surprise me if you have um all kinds of intuitive wisdom flowing through why it happens couldn't really say some people would speculate that you are dipping into the a uh, field of consciousness so you're going to be tapping into that unified field of consciousness and that's going to um allow you to sort of um draw into your what seems to be your individual consciousness wisdom from that place um of course though we we're just speculating about that but also um there are other ways to do it as well for example in zen we use the don't know mind so you try and stay in this place of the not knowing but you have equanimity with the not knowing equanimity is a kind of inner calm and not being pushed or pulled by inner forces and if you can stay with the don't know mind with equanimity that will open you up to uh, intuitive wisdom to flow through and not just intuitive wisdom to do with your life but also spiritual wisdom known as prajna so lots of different traditions will have different ways of tapping into um wisdom from beyond the mind there just a couple of different ways um interesting while well, interestingly while we're on the topic david lynch the film director he's big into the mantra meditation mm-hmm. and he says that all the ideas for his films which are very strange and very creative and really out there he says he gets that from going deep in the meditation with the mantra he calls it um catching the big fish he says wow. if you're just on the surface level of your mind just entertaining the thoughts that are coming up then you're just catching little fish but you go deep into the mind using the mantra and that's when these mm-hmm. big ideas which are um non-conceptual or very strange or don't make sense in the normal way of things that's where you're going to get those ideas um so how it all works fairly mysterious but there are techniques to make it happen Well, funny man. I also have a journal when when I get these sort of intuitive insights I I just write out one point real quick so that I don't really lose it and as you said the ego drags it back our consciousness is like fluctuating it's the ebb and tide right I hope you all enjoyed the conversation and do check out our other videos as well until next time this is your host Raj signing off